Good morning everyone, We're very glad to be here at the Salone del Mobile. The topic is Ancient and Contemporary Albania. It's a true honor to be able to talk about the recent developments in Albania in all sectors. Uh, over the past few years, uh, through this journey, we brought uh, uh, um, planning and architecture in Albania to have an international visibility. We have uh, Albanian projects shared by architects and planners, worldwide famous. And uh, there was still a topic to be discussed and to be investigated more in depth design. There is no best venue than the International Salone del Mobile here in Milan. So I have the honor of a very interesting panel of professionals who actually care for the development uh, as well as uh, the fact that Albania uh, has reached a level of uh, uh, higher progress who will uh, share into our discussion I'd like to give the floor to uh, Jean Blanchard, uh, gallerist. We're very happy to have you here and to meet you eventually. We know that you've made uh, a few trips to Albania. Uh, you entertained uh, uh, relationships to both uh, local artists and craftsmen. Uh, the exhibitions that you have organized uh, um are uh, indeed uh, good to for you to talk about the potentials uh, of our uh, human skills uh, we'd like uh, to hear from you uh, your vision about the future and the potentials that our country has in well, thank you very much for having invited me if you all hear me well I can continue. Now, I have fallen in love. I had a crush on Albania since the past 50 years. I uh, got to the stage of getting uh, uh, into Albania as an illegal when I was uh, 17, but I couldn't get in. But in 1987, therefore, when the regime was still on and uh, Ramiz Aliya was the leader, together with my wife and uh, a group of uh, a couple of other friends, we have uh, found a way to get into Albania. And we had to indeed go through a uh, tough time. Uh, uh, we had to uh, answer a few questions before going uh, uh, um, then i was advised and this was 1987 to uh, cut off my beard because uh, i was too flashy uh, i never did it of course and indeed uh, i was kind of uh, being spotted Albania. For us at that time, since we were coming from Italy, was a kind of a ancient country, uh, but we did not have a chance to befriend uh, and entertain relationships with uh, Albanians because we were always very much concerned. But I can tell you that our feeling was that there was a great friendship and we were very passionate about the country and about the extraordinary food. At that time, if you went to a supermarket, you would see shelves uh, with tins of uh, soups, uh, 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 jams, etc., made by uh, Albanese uh, grandmothers and mothers. Um, from Ancona, we went to Montenegro, and then uh, we traveled by bus for 16 days everywhere. Uh, as soon as we got there, uh, we were taken to the end of Roger Tumstone, uh, or Marcelian, this was the first uh, stage of this journey, and uh, we also played football uh, in Durazzo with Albanese uh, young people. At a certain point of time, police came along and uh, 
they stopped the match. Uh, we went to concerts, uh, we heard uh, people singing, uh, just the traditional costumes, everything was being done uh, because the authorities wanted everything to uh, be perfect. Uh, the square in Tehran was empty and um, all of a sudden, it got filled by thousands of people, giving you the, the feeling of what might have been uh, an a ancient agora, because, of course, there were no cars at that time. In 1987 in Albania, uh, there was a and uh, you would hear footsteps in the street. This is a noise that I never, never forgot. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, right now, it is no longer possible to hear thousands of uh, 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 footstep uh, noises. There were incredible jobs. Um, one of the uh, jobs uh, uh, that you would see in the street was people making uh, more plain plastic when a basket uh, or a bucket would uh, tear, you would walk into the street uh, of the sky with a flame uh, ending in perfectly well. So then we went back to Albania because the regime fell, many Albanians traveled to Italy, and I went very often back to Tirana just for the pleasure of doing it, just for the pleasure of uh, visiting Albania, um, eating Albanian food with my many friends there. And the last time I went back to Albania because of professional reasons, I was the curator of an exhibition called Homer Father. Uh, we exhibited uh, the top uh, craft, uh, what can be called craft masterpieces, that is, when craftsmanship becomes a uh, masterpiece. So, I went to Albania and during that day, we were being built alone. And I remember that your president, Eddie Rama, uh, greeted us and uh, gave us uh, a few information on where to go, etc. But we were just uh, visitors, casual visitors, so to say. But, um, uh, in Tirana, uh, we ran into Elamimai, who was weaving gold threads as they would do uh, uh, temples at uh, the era of Burma. Uh, the golden thread was being purchased in Japan, and, and uh, the artist is still working in Tirana. And then the person who, uh, amongst the hundreds of crafts and craft people, and the chief foundation, uh, uh, who gets a degree, who is uh, a uh, Albanian citizen, who is Tirana uh, gets the pebbles from the um, uh, river. It's an extraordinary uh, sculpture. Frida Lake, the Rita, the who marbled the well. It's, it's um, uh, a craft. Because uh, miraculously, my line is still active. You have to uh, know that uh, uh, in the uh, Alemandi TP uh, book set, uh, there's uh, and uh, this book tells about the title of the book is magnificent is France and Renaissance. And uh, tells about uh, Michele Greco d'Avalone, not a 
uh, dance in Renaissance. Uh, I meant to Dante, read it because it's a wonderful meeting between the between the 1500 and the uh, 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 went away and uh, indeed crossed the theatric and uh, started his work um, by making a fantastic three piece. And uh, he had a fantastic skill, but he was the forebearer of the Byzantine uh, uh, tradition. Um, the book is that of dancing Renaissance, because you see a picture of baby Jesus um, trying to escape. Uh, baby Jesus, of course, knew about his uh, dark future. And uh, this was the instinctive gesture. Of the and uh, the relationships between Italy and Albania, uh, over and beyond. Uh, uh, the meeting of two cultures, uh, uh, natural relationship, so to say. Uh, and I agree with this, and I think the floor to others. Uh, having visited all that, having gone back, and uh, be able to go back in a, in a short time, uh, because I had to travel there uh, again, more than I over and beyond uh, the uh, inevitable negative points that you find anywhere in the world. I was able to discover purity, an ancient and uh, crystal clear form of purity. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Your description has allowed us say, to go back to our childhood memories where the only noises that we, we would be familiar with were steps. So a beautiful image. Thank you so much. And also when it comes to the potentials that we, we see every single day in terms of the craftsmanship from many local artisans, that is also something very important, as well as the dancing renaissance, as, as you said. So, well, if you can still be online, so perhaps we'll try to have a, a kind of a last round before we close the panel. Uh, Armand Bocci, meanwhile, uh, I thought he was the dean of the Faculty of Architecture in uh, Tirana. He's also the president of the Albanian Association of Architects. And he has studied in Italy as well. And he uh, has studied internationally the architecture in Albania. We have a beautiful example both in Tirana and elsewhere in the country. So I have, I have a question to you to start with. So, how about this? Influence uh, that you research that uh, date back to the 20s, 30s, 40s, that from Italy, well, that has had an impact on Albania uh, over the years. And so, is that Italian airport still around? And how about the overall relationship between Italy and Albania? Well, thank you so much. I feel so much privileged to be sitting here, the uh, Salone del Comune. And, uh, and I'm also, I feel honoured that I can introduce Albania right now. Well, actually, before answering your question, I'd love to say that Albania is first and foremost a Mediterranean country with a very specific, kind of one-of-a-kind history. And if, speaking of Albania in our time, actually, we have to say that uh, we, we do show, we do exhibit kind of a build-up of things that have happened over decades and centuries. So indeed, uh, Amala is a, is a crucial point, is a meeting point of many different cultures, ideologies, uh, religions, uh, as well as uh, trade ways. Uh, and uh, so all of these aspects I mentioned, well, they, they kind of build it up. Uh, they literally add it up to one another and then led to what we are today. So if we 
take a look at what happened in the past the century, clearly you could, you could tell the difference between the Ottoman up until the 20s and then the, the fascist occupation, which uh, also has to do a lot with what Frida mentioned earlier on, and then the, the communist the dictatorship which, of course, uh, has a kind of deviated a journey that has uh, already started. And then lastly, perhaps, the post-communism. So all of uh, these, let's say, uh, moments in history, they build it up on one another and they all reflect and they all mirror in, in the architecture, way of being dressed, clothing, and, uh, design. So we're currently seeking uh, for a new identity that, of course, may refer, may mirror also our research for globalization, but at the same time, it should still provide a clear evidence of what we have been in the past. So, trying to reconnect all of this talking at the end uh, to design, because this is actually the design show, uh, I have to say, I'd like to say that, of course, that the Ottoman Empire was very much looking towards the eastern area, but still, they were, they were, ha they were having a, a kind of architecture which was very one of a kind also. And actually, King Dogma, and other Albanian politicians uh, back in the 20s, uh, they started to look at Europe and most of them started to look at Italy. So back in the 20s, uh, they started to literally import uh, Italian architects or also architects from Austria. And um, and they were they were all they were kind of swapping, so they were sending Albanian students over to either Italy and Austria at the same time. So Albanian students uh, they were back as architects to my country, and they were of course uh, let's say designing according to Italian or Austrian influence. So that architecture again is a kind of a hybrid between Western. Eastern inspirations, and uh, and that was very much what was happening back in twenties and thirties, uh, and uh, what well, clearly uh, quite the same was also happening in your country as well in Italy, and that is about uh, urban planning, architecture as well as design. We have beautiful examples of nicely decorated homes, and actually Tirana is a great example because uh, Tirana despite his, uh, let's say, kind of modest past, uh, and it's featuring this beautifully decorated homes. Tirana has experienced uh, a lot of uh, a, a lot of turmoil, I have to say, in the last century. But still, now it is a city that very much uh, keeps mirroring these Italian influences through villas, uh, beautiful buildings, public buildings, uh, and uh, they all keep uh, in themselves so the very the very essence of design that they were drawing inspiration from and uh, something that has been somehow uh, let's say uh, pulled up back again after communism so in the last moment in time that I was uh, described and after of course uh, the fascist uh, occupation as well so during the communism era during the communism years, there has been a research on the new men, and new men, again, was associated with both architecture and design. So the communist ideology said that, of course, all men are to be the same, all homes are to be the same, as well as all profits are to be the same. Therefore, the production of design and architecture were quite modest, as men should not really enjoy any privilege versus anybody else so we were kind of flattening you know we were kind of we were kind of flattening our uh, influences so homes in those decades uh, actually would be fairly similar to one another and would kind of obey to four or five different types uh, but not more than that because that was under the influence of the communism but right after communism and we are now in 2021 a very happy moment where actually we are observing an interesting growth of our economy and uh, and, and 
And of course, uh, I, we need to associate planning, urban planning and design to this as well, but also our way of being, way of living. And again, we are reconnecting back to Italy. Well, of course, it's not just a neighbour country, uh, but it's all, also be a country that has been very close to us. And uh, we are very much uh, also close to date production and design production. So we're in the shoes of the dean of the faculty, which I am. Let me tell you that thanks to the relationships that we have uh, with the Italian university, we started a master in design. Uh, we keep collaborating with Italian faculties for that. And actually we do train students and professionals uh, of, a, of, of design and in their journey uh, they're happy because they see us uh, as a way as a means as a tool to become designers of the future in Albania as well well thank you so much for this interesting historical part you described uh, for describing both ancient and contemporary Albania and the last the last topic you mentioned was so the kind of the flattening production during the communist year. Uh, well, it makes us think uh, about something that has happened in the past and it can still be very contemporary. They were truly essential, minimal, uh, minimalist, uh, kind of recalling the Nordics, uh, uh, right? Uh, the Nordics inspiration. And we're still being fascinated by it when we see it in antique stores. Uh, and if you think about catalogues, also catalogues, they were all displaying kind of the same production. And this is still so much very contemporary. So thank you so much, Armand. I'd love to leave the floor to Yoni Babocci. He is online and, uh, and actually I have a different scale now. Hello, hello. And actually uh, we have started this talk through history and then we spoke through craftsmanship as well. I'd love to ask your experience as a former general manager of planning in the municipality of Tirana. And I know you worked with Stefano Moeri when he came uh, to, to draw the planning of uh, Tirana 2030. So my question is, uh, um, as part of the tools for the planning, have you explored uh, also the territory considering design? So is design a mean, a tool, or is it more of an objective that you're actually reaching out to? So what is the run of 2030? Can you become the capital city of design? Well, I think it's a very interesting topic to discuss. And it revolves around the idea of design being very authoritarian designers know best right it's a very centralized way of making and i think it's fairly easy in product because if you design a firm every individual is free to choose the the phone that you want to buy if you're designing a furniture you have to share amongst your family but it's a few interests competing and as you move to architecture and then even more planning, then it becomes progressively more difficult to find a design which fits and that kind of makes everybody happy. Therefore, the role of designers needs to change necessarily from the guy that knows best and can design a product or a network or a facade for you. you have change to the guy or the girl who's able to combine things best and be able to negotiate all this interest because as people say in Italy all tastes are the same so you have to move to the level where you're somehow forcing people and that is most obvious in cities and the more you have to change the role of the designers. With Adelina, we used to talk a lot through research by designing, co-design, interest, interesting new approach of a decade ago, and how can we change the role of designers? But the more I work with Stefano and Steve, which is, and all of the people who were able to transform Tirana in the past five or six years, uh, the more I realize that we need less 
designers and we need more proactive citizens. And what comes to mind is what Dan Schertz has said a while ago, 17 uh, proactively decided to come and visit Albania. Well, this is exactly what I mean. So it, it, this is what we want to do and try to change the Iran of 2030. So we're, the world is moving from nation state to local government, from traditional media, centralized one voice to social media. And I think that this illustrates the big power that the small minorities can have when they want to change the face of the city. And also, as public officials and architects and designers, we're part of this process as well. One thing I keep thinking about, for example, in design, a lot of innovation is happening in crowdfunding. For instance, Kickstarters allow designers to come up with an idea and see how many people are buying and are willing to pay for your idea even before you finish the product. We haven't seen that approach to cities. We haven't seen that similar approach uh, elsewhere. We do agriculture, we do design, we do interventions in cities and governments, and we still haven't arrived to a decentralized moment where the citizens uh, are trying to push forward these ideas, uh, trying to push forward a certain design. And this is something that can really help in Tirana become become and innovate faster than other cities. We are, what we always say at the border, be, be, between West, West and East, developed world, developing world, between communism before and kind of the Western world. So we've always been at this barrier and, and, and this is the boundary where we can experiment a bit more. A few hours from now, I think uh, Gartner is going to speak, and I'm sure he's going to say, he's going to mention that uh, some people from Silicon Valley are designing new cities from the beginning in the middle of nowhere, where basically they can have all the right design, all the right kind of ideas, policies, and they can become new centers where people will want to move in 2030. And that is going to be our competition. And it sounds very centralized, a bit like product design and cities. I don't know whether it will work, but I'm sure that is the competition that cities all around the world will have. And this is why we need to innovate and move a bit faster now, changing the way we think about design, a bit like what we did with the planning. We never designed the plan, we set a lot of frameworks, a lot of boundaries. Some of them are flexible, some are not. And the people that have to navigate, both designers and architects have to navigate the path and find the path that works best for them. And we did something that, we didn't do something that was too stringent, but at the same time, it wasn't, it, it wasn't free or abstract either. It was something in between. And the, the secret to the city of Tirana 2030 is finding the right balance between how much are we able to decentralize, how much are we able to evolve power and the ability to design for citizens, but at the same time, how can we use networks and connect decentralized ideas all together? So when you think about, for example, architecture and pilot project, we've done a lot of them in Tirana. Well, the next layer is how to how we connect them together. How do we learn from one another? How can we make communities own them and then sort of together design the next stage and the next level in urban design in cities? Thank you, Yoni. That is a very interesting point of view. I should uh, continue now in Italian. It's very interesting what you said, uh, your vision as well. It's a challenge that is, in one way or another, we have to create a harmony between uh, the uh, law and the restrictions and uh, the relationship with flexibility. This is a challenge that institutions and uh, urban planners uh, are 
An in connection with this, I would like to give the floor to Adelina Greca, the director of the National Agency for Urban Planning. Uh, the uh, past four years approved 55 plans covering almost completely the whole of the territory. This is almost a unique process uh, belonging to uh, another attitude. Uh, uh, in such a short time, you're planning the entire national territory. So, you are probably going to be facing with a lot of challenges. Uh, the plans have been uh, drafted by local uh, entities in collaboration with the international architectural studios. And, uh, um, Architecture is important from the point of view of citizens as well. Uh, and I want to thank the Creda for organizing this event together with uh, Stefano Boeri's team and for putting Albania on the map of this important uh, design event. And that is happening here. As you only mentioned as well, this uh, planning process has been developed Albania recently. We have been learning from our past and also from other people's mistakes that uh, the process is just uh, making uh, working instruments in progress and not as fixed uh, uh, instruments, uh, not an authoritarian guideline, but a, a rather more orient design oriented approach. What comes to my mind talking about design is this idea of clustering. So during our planning process, uh, we've been tracking what has been happening somehow informally in the Albanian territory. Maybe some of you know that Albania for almost 15 or maybe 20 years has been developed in an informal way without any rules. Anyone could do anything as they saw fit. Uh, but this is not totally wrong. In most cases, what happened, or what we saw happening, was also something smart. So, when it comes to the industrial part, uh, we're so clustering in the territory, many small industries and or manufacturers, they started to cluster and business that they found, or their businesses rather, were founded were Previously, there was a kind of an industry, um, kind of uh, information and expertise coming before the 90s. And they were also clustering in a way uh, that uh, businesses uh, that, uh, could collaborate together to uh, uh, make things happen better uh, were coming next to another. And during this planning process, uh, we tracked down uh, this kind of partnership and emphasized it. Uh, so in our plans, we have these areas where these clusters could be um, made uh, progress. And uh, what I see, and I'm talking at this point uh, um, as an architect, but also uh, from my own position, we should be more focused now on how to let's say, make uh, these clusters uh, make a progress, uh, or how to cluster these industries with businesses, and why not with businesses outside of Albania. So, uh, what we have in Albania today is a lot of expertise in tailor-made design uh, furniture, but uh, we don't have an industry that may mass produce these pieces of furniture. And what you have in Italy, or Italy has, is indeed uh, this industry. So what could happen in these two countries is a cooperation. We have a lot of ex-industrial sites that are almost non-functioning today. And surrounding these uh, former industrial sites, there's a lot of expertise that could be put at use to uh, build uh, better things or producing more value. Now, I see uh, this event, our talk today, as a kind of seed to connect 
to connect Italy and Albania in a different way. We have this tradition, Armand um, explained it a little bit, started in, tw in the 20s of influence by architect uh, Italian architecture and has been influenced um, by Italian television over the past 20 years, over the past 20 years, Albania, uh, Albanians have lived in Italy and uh, have brought uh, a lot of Italian culture to Albania. And I think that the next step would be to think more in terms of industry, so how we can collaborate more and uh, to put the Albanian potential at a different level in state. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adelina. So about uh, the uh, great melting pot that we have between our two cultures. We have the Adriatic Sea in between. Uh, it defines us, but at the same time unites us. And uh, right now, uh, where barriers are no longer there, the cultural exchange continues to be very flexible between the two countries. But at the same time, artistic exchange is what happens. And maybe a panel such as our own today uh, might uh, uh, give further support and so I'd like to connect again to back to Jean who's not here with us. But I thought whether we could uh, create a new exhibition in Australia by for instance bringing a very type of craftsman and crafts but maybe we can indeed talk about it uh, uh, in the future. I would like to close and give the chance to the mayor of Tirana to say projects in terms of design and in terms of Tirana, the capital of Albania. To you the floor. It was fantastic for once and for a change to sit here and not be there. We are now the people who get stuff done and deliver for our city. So thank you very much for your presentations. But there, there were a couple of uh, things that I was thinking, and I shall translate them into it. And two things. Uh, the biggest event uh, of the last month of this year was Afghanistan. Uh, do you all agree? One of the biggest events in Italy is the Salone del Mobile. And I think this is the biggest contrast uh, between Joseph Na, uh, used to call our hard soft power. And the question forever has been uh, do you influence people more with guns and ships and bulletproof vehicles and armored vehicles or carriers? Or do you? influenced more civilization through art, design, fashion and food and music. I don't think that there is a problem for this. But clearly there's a lot to do on hardware and hard power alone. Eventually I have given up and maybe felt the magnetic pull of the soft power, the power of design, fashion, and music and literature and culture is important. So if the states of China or Russia uh, are big hard powers of today's civilization, uh, one could definitely say that Italy is uh, the number one power of our civilization. And a lot of the stories of these uh, poles we were growing up, uh, we uh, used certain uh, uh, to catch up the um, you know, the insects, etc. I grew up with soap operas and uh, this shows that in, long, in the long run, uh, at least uh, uh, that uh, soft power eventually is the best strategy. You can change the world, you can change the civilization. I was proud to work not only with this team and Yoni, and, uh, but, uh, to be here in Italy, um, 
to redesign Tirana now for the next century. And the second point that I wanted to make is that all of you, except, except uh, uh, in the states, are using a mask. It's a clear sign, it's a clear insignia that we are in a war, war uh, an invisible uh, uh, this, this virus. And before that, we had two terrible um, earthquakes, and with Casamonte and Boeri, we designed uh, the earthquakes. Um, and uh, uh, the Chinese for catastrophe have two brush uh, drop. One uh, main means danger, and the other brush in every dangerous situation. In every catastrophe lies an opportunity to do things maybe a bit better, maybe a bit different, maybe a bit more inclusive. So the using this of the earthquake also as an opportunity. I remember I grew up in Tirana, the city that I now love leading. There were 170 cars, 170 when Jean-Luc was visiting. And now I remember when a truck would go through our neighbor, all the boys would, would be run to get a free ride on the back of a truck. And then the communism collapsed. So the people who left the country coming to Italy, and we heard, we, had, we heard from the prime minister the commemoration of uh, La Nave Dolce, so after these people got settled in Italy, when they came back in Tirana and Albania, they wanted to show a status symbol, a trophy, to prove to their neighbors that they made it in capitalism and the trophy was a car. And ever since uh, we've had this love affair with automobiles, with vehicles. And at times uh, we remember this question, why are we building cities? Uh, we're building cities for cars and for people. Well, the disaster can become an opportunity, COVID, earthquake, to rethink. Why do we do the job that we do? Do we design for sake of being in saloon or to help people's lives and to enhance their experiences? I know I don't want anybody to have a disaster. Let me tell you, when they come, I think there can still be a great opportunity. And it will show you how we will use that in Tirana as an opportunity. I woke up on a day and I saw both uh, Washington Post and another American magazine had Tirana on the cover, and they were showing people be, being disinfected before they were getting into the market. So, well, actually, even before they knew what COVID was all about. So design come from unusual places, unusual circumstances, but it is an ultimate opportunity that from a disaster, we can make this better. So thank you so much. I love this panel and I hope you've had translation meanwhile. Okay, great. So I don't have to repeat everything back in Italian. And I look forward to listening to the to the next to the next panel panels. And Bjarke Ingels, who's the designer, who's a famous designer, he'll be, he'll be speaking later on, right? There will be oh, there will be a five o'clock talk. Uh, so you will be hearing about Tirana and Albania also from the Arche Ingels. Thank you. Thank you once again. Well, thank you all from my side as well. And thank you for the great opportunity. We're we'll so very happy that we have this uh, moment to speak through Albania and hopefully we'll be here back again next year after seeding some of the seeds that we will be able to see the fruits of next year. Thank you. So thank you, thank you so much. Let me tell you that Albania is already protagonist of the new role, as Maria Michele Greco da Valona used to say. You may look at the Western world, and but also keep the Eastern in your heart. And he's asking me to get this message across. So this was a message from Jean Blanchard. Thank you, Jean. <laughs>